Second Kings, a different uh, message tonight as we prepare for next Sunday, and we're going to read verses 1 through 7. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, and thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons, and shalt pour out unto all those vessels, and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him, and shut the door upon her and upon her sons, who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. And it came to pass, when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou in thy children of the rest. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the words of the prophet, what shall I do for thee? And we thank you that we have a God who cares for us and a Savior who provides for us. And tonight we pray, Lord, that you would help us to learn of your deliverance and your provision and how you desire to meet our every need. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful spirit and the privilege of serving at Lancaster Baptist Church. And I pray that you would bless this time, the song we're to hear, and then the message from your word. And I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, most of us will sit down somewhere this week and we'll think about next Sunday's offering. And we'll think about the opportunity, the need, the challenge. And sometimes when we do that, we realize quickly our resources are so limited. And tonight we see a widow, a widow who had no way to pay her debt, a widow who looked at her situation and felt so helpless. And I believe in the very early moment of this message, it would be vital for us to remember that whenever we look at our situation, it's always going to seem hopeless. But whenever we look to God in the midst of the situation, there will be hope and there will be an ability. The Christian life will never make sense unless your eyes are focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Christian life will never make sense. You will feel inadequate unless you understand His acceptance. You will feel unprepared unless you understand His sovereignty. You will feel ill-equipped unless you understand it's not you living the Christian life. It's Christ living it through you. And this woman was focusing on all the wrong things. She was focusing on herself rather than focusing on God. Now, 2 Kings begins with Elijah's encounter with an Israeli king by the name of Ahaziah. And we know from the passage in 2 Kings that Elijah, after that, is taken up in God's chariot. And as he is taken up, Elisha is there standing in his place. Perhaps you'd like to notice just a few verses there that speak of this. And I think of this passage as we read in verse number 9, the Bible says, And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elisha said unto, uh, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou See me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so unto thee. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel. The mantle passed from Elijah to Elisha. And now we come to a place in history where Jehoram, from the family of Ahab, 
was ruling in Samaria, the northernmost capital of Israel. And we see on the map the divided kingdom, and it was in the north where Elisha began to prophesy for the Lord. This would have been about 852 B.C. It was during an early portion of Elisha's ministry that the words we read tonight were recorded. The words of a widow woman, a woman whose husband was a prophet, and her husband had died, and now she was without care for her life. It is our privilege from time to time to help widows in need in our church and sometimes outside of our church. Periodically, we have sent love offerings to Mrs. Curtis Hudson as uh, she has need in her life. And it's a great privilege to minister to widows. And we see here a widow whose husband was a prophet, perhaps a friend of Elisha's, but now he had passed away and she was in dire need in her life. And we see tonight in the passage how that God made provision for this dear widow woman, a woman who had nothing but a woman that God had seen and God desired to help. This is not the same woman some of us have heard about from 1 Kings 17, the widow at Zarephath. This is an entirely different woman, uh, a preacher's wife, if you will, whose husband had gone on to be with the Lord. As we open the Word of God tonight, I want you to notice, first of all, the dilemma of this woman. The Bible tells us in verse 1, Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. She cries out to Elisha. Perhaps she sensed in her soul, Elisha will understand. He's a preacher. He's a prophet, like my husband was. And she cries out to Elisha about the need. In great distress, she is telling that her husband's property was now severely in debt. And she makes a plea based upon her husband's faithfulness to Jehovah. I want you to see that in the Bible. It says in verse number one, Thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. May I say, men, tonight, that should you precede your wife in death, it would be a wonderful legacy if your wife could say, you know that my husband feared God. You know that my husband was a man of God, a man that was true to God. And though this woman was poor financially, she was rich in that she had a faithful husband who feared the Lord. Well, her husband was dead. And now the creditors have come. The Bible says in verse 1, and the creditor is come. It doesn't matter if it's 850 B.C. or 2018 A.D. It's never good when you say the creditor has come, right? The comforter has come. That's a beautiful thing. The creditor has come. Not so beautiful at all. And according to Mosaic law, the creditors could enslave the debtor's children. They could take them as property as a way to pay the bill. I remember years ago when I was witnessing to a man from Papua New Guinea and had the privilege of leading him to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and he had heard me preaching about marriage and he'd come and ask some questions at a meeting where I was preaching in Australia and we sat down and discerned that he was not saved and after 30 or 4 minutes he was uh, able to accept Christ as his Savior. And I'll never forget what he said to me after he got saved. He said, this is so wonderful. He said, now I can be a better husband for both of my wives. I remember taking him to the missionary and saying, I helped him get saved. You can disciple him from here on out. I had never experienced that in my soul winning years. And I found out the reason that he had two wives was because a man had owed him a debt that he could not pay. And so the man gave him his oldest daughter in trade for the debt that he owed and he liked this young lady and decided that he would marry her and so he had two wives and literally one of them was given as property to him and that was just maybe 10 or 12 years ago and so it was in the Old Testament that someone could literally lose their children if they did not pay their bills according to the laws of the Hebrews they were considered the property of their parents and they had the right to dispose of them however they would want 
And I pause now to say to all of the teenagers, thank God that we do not live in the Old Testament. Thank God that we live in the age of grace. Because you could push that line just one too many times and be given to MasterCard for the rest of your life. (laughs) The creditor had come. And the widow was without help. And here we see this dilemma, a great dilemma indeed. But I want you to notice secondly tonight the directions of the prophet. What does the prophet say? And what does God say to us when we feel our backs are against a wall? We feel that we have such limitations. The Bible says in verse 2, And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? Now, I want you to notice two very important questions. First of all, this question, What shall I do for thee? And I want to say tonight, what a great question. You know, sometimes we as Christians say the dumbest things at the worst of times. Sometimes I could hear someone saying to a woman like this, well, what did you do with all your money? Or how have you been wasting your money? Or how did you get into this situation? Or didn't your husband prepare for this? Isn't it interesting how quickly we can judge and say something like that? when instead we should be saying, how can I help? What can I do to help? And Elisha says, what shall I, or what can I do for you? And I want to remind you tonight that there are people all around us. There are people in our community. And it's easy for us to say to them, well, you ought to just pull up your bootstraps and you ought to make a difference. But maybe sometimes it's good to have their paradigm and to recognize some trials and difficulties that they're having. It's easy to judge someone when they're having a hard time in their relationship. By the way, the way I normally judge that is I just stick around six months, 12 months, 18 months later and see who's still in church worshiping the Lord. It's usually better to just let time go by and see who's being faithful to God. And this woman was being faithful. She was not needing judgment. She needed help. And he said, how can I be of service to you? And I'm thankful tonight that when I have trouble and when I go to the Lord in prayer, that he says to me, how can I help you? I'm thankful that I have a Savior whose yoke is easy and his burden is light. And that when I come to him, I don't find judgment. I may find correction. Periodically, I may find some chastisement as it is needed. But I find mercy with my Lord. And I can come to Him, my Redeemer, in times of dilemma, and that He will say, what shall I do for thee? And if you'll come to Him this week and say, Lord, I want to have part in the offering Sunday, I believe He'll say to you, what shall I do for you? How can I help you? I'm thankful that the Lord is always accessible to me. The Bible says, let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I'm thankful that when I come to the Lord and maybe you have squandered some finances or maybe you did make a bad deal or maybe you have uh, sinned in some way, I'm thankful that no matter what has been going on in your life, that you can find grace to help in time of need. And yes, Elijah and Elisha were fiery prophets of God, but here we see the compassion of the prophet. What can I do to help you? I believe that when you tighten your hold on God, He lessens trouble's hold on you. And when you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need help, that He is willing and able to help you. He will never abandon you. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 and 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For He hath said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man will do unto me. In 33 years, I have seen many trends in Christianity. I have seen many changes, uh, even with independent Baptists. I have seen many people come and go. I have seen the offerings up and down. I have seen enrollments up and down. I've seen many trends in 33 years. But I can testify to you tonight that my God has been faithful through all of these years. And that oftentimes He says to me in my devotional time with Him, What can I do for you? How can I help you in this time? 
I remember back in 1986 when I preached my first time at Lancaster Baptist Church. And I remember when they dismissed me and, and held a little private business meeting and 12 people voted for me to be the pastor. And I remember as they said, we want you to come and preach. We can't pay you. We don't have medical insurance. Terry was expecting Christine at that time. And uh, they said, but we, we would like you to come. I really had no interest in it. I had, I had no, uh, no real idea that I was uh, to pastor this church at all. And yet, the next day, as we were driving up at the sequoia trees in the redwood forest, I reached over and took Terry by the hand. I said, honey, I can't explain this, but it just feels to me like God is moving my heart. And, and I know they only have one Kmart. <laughs> and they don't have a mall. And I think they might have had McDonald's. I can't remember. But I said, I just feel like the Lord is leading us. I remember when we came here in July of 1986, uh, we had medical insurance and $400 a month support. And we began to trust the Lord. We began to just learn what it meant to live by faith. I tried to call some other churches and raise some more support. And, and yet many times it didn't come for a month or two or three. And and, uh, and, and yet we found that God was able. We found that God would come oftentimes and he would say, as he said here to this dear widow lady, what shall I do for thee? I'll never forget preaching in San Francisco at a church where I was there as a guest speaker for the missions conference and I did my best to preach about Lancaster and Southern California and I remember as I was leaving and as I preached this morning, those that communicate in the Word, we communicate with them, and they gave me, a, uh, they gave me an envelope, and, and uh, we were just at one of those times where literally praying for groceries. Now I remember not even getting out of the parking lot and opening up that envelope as I preached there. Brother Stensis, as a missionary, I'm sure you've done that. And I opened up that envelope, and as I did, there was not enough in that envelope to even pay the gas to San Francisco and back to Lancaster. I think it was about maybe $75 was the honorarium. And I had driven about six hours there. And I was driving until about two in the morning to get home. I, I'll admit, I'm, I'm, I'm human like anyone else. It was a little discouraging. And I'll admit it kind of frustrated me. And I thought to myself, what kind of a pastor is this? And he invited me up. I know I'm young, but I, I mean, I did come up all that way. And I remember on Interstate 5 about Kettleman City, I had to pull over and tell the devil to get out because I was a little bit discouraged. And I gave it to the Lord. And I came on home, and I remember Terry said, how did it go? And she asked, as probably many wives would ask, did you get some money for groceries? I said, well, honey, I, I, they gave me $75. And she didn't say anything. Thank God for a wife for 33 years who's never complained in the ministry. But in my heart, I was concerned. And I was trying to figure out how we were going to make some ends meet. And I'll never forget four or five days later going to the mailbox and opening up a letter from Boca Raton, Florida. I'd never been to Boca Raton, Florida. Still this day, I've never been there. And there was a letter, and the lady in the letter said, Dear Brother Chapel, my husband and I were on vacation just this past week in San Francisco, California. We went in and and we heard you as you preached and shared your vision for the new church. And the Lord laid on our heart to send you this love offering. And they sent $500 to help us along the way. I remember a few days after that, there was a man that came to the little office I had at the old building. Multicolor patched carpet, rainbows on the wall for the nursery. As it was doubling for the office and the nursery at that time. It was very, very cool. And a man walked in, he was so troubled, and he said, uh, he said, my, my daughter's at the hospital, and, and they said that her baby's going to be stillborn. And I was a Baptist when I was a kid, and I want somebody to pray for my daughter. Well, I went over there, my first hospital visit in Lancaster, someone I didn't know who was losing a baby. And I walked in there, and as I did, the nurse gave me a seashell and some sterile water, and I walked into myself thinking, Lord, I have no idea what this is for. 
And then I realized she, she thought maybe I was a Catholic priest and I was going to do the last rites. That's what she thought. And when I figured that out, I put the seashell down over here on the shelf. And I introduced myself and I shared some scriptures about David's child with Bathsheba and how he said, I cannot bring you back to me, but I will go to you. And I shared the gospel with the dear lady and waited there and prayed and just tried to talk to her husband and her dad. I guess for two, three hours I tried to help. I didn't know what else to do. I remember having a little funeral for that, that stillborn baby a few, few days later just at the graveside. And as I was leaving, that man came and he shook my hand and he said, here's something we want to thank you as a family for helping. There was a check for $1,000 for Lancaster Baptist Church. I remember a few weeks after that, there was a man that came into the church and he was walking all around the church. And I said, can I help you? He said, yeah, I heard the property's been foreclosed upon. I said, you did? I hadn't heard that myself, and I was a pastor. And we began to talk about it, and through some legal maneuvering, we got some bills paid I didn't know about, got it out of potential foreclosure. Never forget that man, Mr. Stello, Joe Stello Realty. And as we walked around, and, and I told him, I'm, I'm going to fight this. We don't want to give up the property. He said, well... He said, I sure understand that. And just a few days later, he called me up. He said, I've got somebody that owns some property out here at Bacchus Road out here in Kern County. And he said, uh, they don't want to pay the taxes anymore. And he said, I thought maybe they might just donate it to your church. He said, I think it's worth something. And I said, well, and I, and I didn't know anything back then about checking tax records. I could have been, he could have been snookering me, you know. But I said, it, it was some, some land for free. I said, we'll take it. And they wrote up the documents. I think it was a few weeks after that when the title closed and the check came to the church for $15,000. Ladies and gentlemen, I could stand here all night and tell you that my God is able. Amen. I can tell you that I've had a God for 33 years who has said, what can I do for you? How can I help you? What can I do for you? in time of need and that is your God tonight and even as Elisha said what can I do for you the Lord is saying what can I do for you he invites us and he provides for us the Bible says that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us he says what shall I do for you now friend if you'll come to him like the widow did I believe the Lord wants to provide and the Lord wants to meet the need once again. But notice the second question in the verse. He says to her, what shall I do for thee? Tell me. And notice the second question. What hast thou in thine house? Or what hast thou in the house? Let's say that together, shall we? What hast thou? Now this is a biblical principle. We serve a God who says, what can I do for you? But he always asks this second question. What is that in thine house what do you have that you are willing to trust me with he is always going to ask us to do by faith what we can do before he touches that faith with his miraculous power I think of Moses in Exodus chapter 4 and I think of the question that God said to Moses Moses and Moses said but, 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 but God, 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 God I can, 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 can't preach I have a st st stammering tongue. And he said, I can't lead these people. And God said, Moses, what is that in thine hand? And Moses had to be willing to throw down the rod and then pick it up as a snake again and turn into a rod again before God would part the waters, before God would bring the plagues. Moses had to be willing to throw down the rod. He had to take what was in his hand and give it to the Lord. I think of the little lad in John chapter 6. And I think of those worried disciples. They didn't know how everyone would be fed. Uh, they didn't know how, how it would be possible to please the great crowd. And one of the disciples said, Jesus, there is a lad here with five barley loaves and two small fishes. But they are, what are they among so many? And someone might say, why, who are these people in Lancaster, California, uh, in the desert. And who are these people in this uh, place to think that something miraculous could continue to go forward for God? 
But Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. And the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes, as many as they would. And if you've ever read this story, not only did they feed the 5,000, but there were baskets full left over because God had provided for the need. But before God did the miracle, he needed a little boy who had enough faith to say, I'm just a kid, and I don't have a lot, but what I have, I'm willing to give. What I have, I'm willing to give. And Jesus says, how can I help you? And what is that in your house? I think of the widow who gave the widow's might. Jesus sat over against the treasury. And he watched the rich as they cast in from their abundance. And he called unto his disciples and said, Verily I say unto you, this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. I notice from that passage found in Mark chapter 12 that Jesus observes our giving pattern. And I notice from this passage that as he observed, he saw that some gave from their abundance and some gave from their need, and he commends this widow that she did what she could. I think of the Corinthian church and how they had first a willing mind and how they gave according not to what they had, but even according to what they did not have. And I believe that this week the Lord will ask you, how can I help you? And you might say, Lord, I need help with my children. I need help for the offering. I need wisdom at work. And sometimes when we say, Lord, when he says, how can I help you? He will say also, well, what do you have already in your house? Do you have a Bible to read? Do you have a way to be involved? Do you have something to give? What is that in your house? We see the dilemma of the woman. We hear the direction of the prophet. But notice thirdly tonight, the deliverance of a family. Notice how God delivers this dear family. Verse 2, the Bible says, And Elijah said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house, save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go, borrow, borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. Now, I want you to notice the mindset of this woman because I believe she may have been a Baptist. Though there were no Baptist churches in this particular time, though John the Baptist had not yet been born, I believe she is a distant relative to some of us as Baptists. You say, why do you say that? I want you to notice what she says in verse 2. And she said, thine handmaid hath not anything in the house. The first thing she said was, I don't have anything. The first thing she did was focus on what she did not have, on the negative. And, and may I say to you tonight, Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 is such an important verse. There is that scattereth and yet increaseth, and there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. This is the man that says, you know, I would give, but I've got to watch out for a rainy day, so I'm going to invest in Enron. I've got to take care that I preserve assets, so I'm going to put it in this or in that. And God says, okay, there is that withholdeth, but it tendeth to poverty. My friend, you cannot outgive God. Giving is not a matter of can and can't. It is a matter of will and won't. And this woman was at that point because the first thing she said was, I don't have anything in this house. But then notice in verse 2, she says, Save a pot of oil. So the woman presents to the prophet a pot of oil. Oil was used as an element for anointing bodies after bathing. Sometimes it was used, as in the case of Jesus, in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea to anoint the body of the deceased. And some actually think, and some scholars have said, that this pot of oil may very well have been kept for her burial. This may have been her last possession for her sons to bury her. 
It was more than likely olive oil. It was of some value to her. It could have been used for different ailments. It could have been used even for cooking. But it was something. She had something. And every one of us have something. And while many Christians say, I have nothing, then when they're completely honest with God, they'll say, well, I do have an entire storage unit full. <laughs> and I do have this, and I do have that, and I have this account and that account. And, but, but our first response is always to say, I have nothing. And what we learn is that in stewardship, God provides raw materials to us. He's given us certain assets, and He wants us to do something with those. And before He did the miracle for the woman, He wanted her to present what she had and what she could do in a presentation of faith. Because we either give by reason or we give by revelation. And this woman could have reasoned that she had nothing to give or she could have trusted God and by revelation of God, give and it shall be given unto you. And she was learning in her faith to grow from I have nothing to the point of I have something. And by the way, all of us should present all that we are and all that we have as a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ. And so there's a presentation of faith and there's a presentation of sacrifice. And a vision that is not worthy of sacrifice is not a Christ-like vision. And here we see a woman who will first make a sacrifice. She will first pour out the last remaining substance of her life before God would touch it and meet the need in a super abundant way. David was similar in his life. David, as he went to the threshing floor of Ornan, David, the Bible tells us, came to this place where he wanted to worship God. And Ornan said to David, David, you can have this property. If you want to worship God here, just take it. By the way, thank God for Ornan's spirit. But David said in 2 Samuel chapter 24 and verse 24, And the king said unto Ornan, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which doth cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and oxen for 50 shekels of silver. Every one of us ought to say tonight, I want to have a part in reaching the children of the Antelope Valley. You might say, my kids are grown. I don't have grandkids here. But every one of us ought to say, listen, I want to see a place that so excites children that when they come to church, they're bringing mommy and daddy back the next Sunday. We ought to say we're excited to build the bus bar in a place when the highway patrol walk in, they'll say, this church does it right. All to the glory of God and for the safety of more than 35 vehicles that this church runs on the city streets every single day. It's time that we provide a place that will keep the buses rolling so that little children like my wife Terry Chapel, who came to Sunday school on a bus in the seventh grade and heard the gospel and got saved so that they'll be able to still be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ and that will not take the attitude of I have nothing but will take the attitude of well I have some loaves and fish and I have a rod and I have some oil and Lord whatever I have it's yours Lord I want you to have it and so she presents the pot of oil, but now she has to obey God's revelation. And I want you to see in verse 3 what God revealed through Elisha. He said, go, borrow the vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. And I love this phrase, borrow not a few. Borrow not a few. Folks, you better decide what kind of miracle you want God to do in your life. You're going to borrow a pot going to get a little Tupperware from your neighbor? Or are you going to get ready for God to do something in your life? Go borrow. These are commands. God says, I want you to go. And God's solutions often involve us going. I think of missionaries that will go to a foreign field. I think of Brother John eventually going off to plant a church. It's, at some point it will not make sense but God will say, go, and you step out, and you follow, and you do what God has called you to do. And then God says, I want you to go, and no, notice the next word here in verse 3. He said, go, borrow. Now some of you say, I'm not really good at the go, but I'm really good at the borrow. I've done really good at that part right there. <laughs> I read not long ago that, that uh, Michael Phelps, when he was in his Olympic 
uh, uh, Olympic prime, that he would swim sometimes 50 miles, 50 miles a week. And he would lift all kinds of weights. I forget how many pounds, how many repetitions. He did all these different exercises. And to keep all of that going, sometimes he ate 20,000 calories a day just to keep it all going. Now, I've got the calorie part down so far. I'm just kind of <laughs> working on it, you know. Some of you are like that. You're like, I don't know about stepping out by faith, but I can borrow. I can do that. I understand that word. Well, he wasn't telling her to get in more debt. He was telling her, I want you to go get more pots because since you're willing to give what you have, I'm going to give you so much that you're not going to be able to hold it all. So go borrow, and borrow not a few. And I believe that some of us in this room, in this year of revival, need to come back to a belief that we serve a God who's able to replenish, and He's able to supply. Listen, my friend, it, it, it's not the devil, and it's not the stock market, and it's not the real estate market that's been blessing you these past 12 months. There is a God in heaven who has been blessing you, and He's been blessing me, so that we can be a blessing to others, my friend. And God says, I want you to borrow not a few. Get a whole bunch. Get some big ones. And I, I believe tonight that we can learn from that. That's a measure of faith. And that we ought to be willing to do what God has called us to do. And we ought to learn how to obey God's instructions. Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure and pressed down. And running over shall men give into your bosom. I heard about a police officer who was waiting to catch some speeding drivers. And amazingly, he saw a car that came by him, and he, he, he was clocking the speed, and the car came by 22 miles an hour. Well, he pulled the car over, and he noticed there were five elderly ladies in the car, and, and the lady that was driving was confused. She said, why did you pull me over? She said, I was going exactly the speed limit. The officer said, well, you weren't speeding, but you were driving dangerously slow. She said, slower than the speed limit? I was going exactly 22, and he began to laugh. And, uh, and, and, and as he looked at her, he said, ma'am, uh, she pointed up at the sign, I'm going exactly 22. He said, ma'am, that's not the speed limit, that's the route number, route number 22. She said, oh, she was so embarrassed. The officer said, by the way, before I go, is everyone in here okay? Said, you all look pretty shook up. And a lady in the back said, oh, we'll be all right in a minute, we just got off of route 119. <laughs> now... What I'm telling you is it's important, it's important to listen to instructions. And her instructions were very simple. Go and borrow. Faith is doing all we can do according to God's instructions and believing that He will do the rest. Faith is trusting in God. I do not know, church, what God has in store just around the corner. I do not know how God intends to bless this church. I only know that He will not pour out His superabundant blessing on this church if we're withholding the pot of oil that He puts on our heart to give. How many of you understand what I'm saying? I remember when God provided $3 million for the Revels building that did not come from our church. But it came in a season when we were bringing our pots to the Lord and we were doing everything we knew how to do to build that $10 million building and God said, boy, look at those people in Lancaster. They're bringing their pots to the Lord. They're, they're giving their, their, their 100, their 500, their 10,000, their 20,000. They're, they're doing as much as they can do, but I'm just going to kick a big old pot their way. That's what God can do. And he says, I want you to bring your pot. Bring not a few. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the greatest decision in Noah's life was not to build the ark. It was to walk by faith. It was to do what God told him to do, one nail at a time, one board at a time. And he says to her, make your preparation. And he says to her, fill the vessels. And notice in verse 4, he says, when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and thy sons, and thou shalt pour out all those vessels. And, and he said, I want the door shut. I don't want the creditors coming in here. I don't want someone interrupting what I'm about to do. He said, I want to pour out upon you my blessing. And while there was a vessel to fill, uh, there, there was oil sufficient, and yet it ceased to flow. And, and, and God said, I'm not going to let this flow uh, cease to flow. I'm going to continue to give it uh, oil barrel after oil barrel. I'm 
going to meet your need. Jeremiah 32 and 17, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power, and stretched out their arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. And when you see God do the hard thing, and you see God do what we knew we could not do, you're able to say, to God be the glory for the great things he has done. Had a lady in our church for many years, and she was um, saved through our bus ministry. She kind of came from a rough background, and when she first started coming to church, she'd come up and compliment my messages in the most colorful ways. Some people would say, praise the Lord for that message. She just said it differently than that. And uh, she uh, was coming out of a life of drugs and and uh, was a heavy smoker and just had a lot of habits. But she began to grow in the Lord. And I'll never forget the first time we had a banquet that she was going to attend. And she came up to me in the foyer and I'd been preaching on giving. And sometimes when you're preaching on giving and stewardship, uh, people will say and ask things that are greatly discouraging. <laughs> and, um, and, and so her question to me was this. Uh, her first question, Pastor, I want to come to the banquet, but could you buy my ticket for the banquet? Now, for those of you that are new here, we, we give away tickets to those types of events even sometimes, but, but uh, I said to her, I said, well, you need to at least have faith for the ticket. I said, if God doesn't provide the ticket, you let me know, but let's pray that God can provide the $10 for the ticket, Okay. And so she came to me the next week. She was so excited. God provided $10 for the ticket, and she was able to get her own ticket to come to the bank. Well, that was victory number one. But her next question, Pastor, do you think you could buy me a dress for the banquet? And she was, you know, she's from a rough background. And I said, well, I said, let's ask God and see if he could provide for you a dress for the banquet. And I'll pray with you, and let's pray about that. And she came to me the next Sunday, and she said, Pastor, God provided me a dress for the banquet. And she said, I got it at a secondhand store, and it's never been used, and there's tags still on it. And, and she said, I'll come, and, I'll come and show you when we have the banquet. And, and that first year, all she could do was buy a ticket and buy a dress. I don't know if she gave anything. But you know that lady, she began to go to school. She became a nurse. God changed her life at Lancaster Baptist Church. And I remember one of the last little letters she wrote to me. She said, Pastor, the March offering is the highlight of my year. It's the ball, the prom, homecoming all in one. I don't have to give. I get to give. I love to give. I want to give. I need to give. I pray to give. I work to give. Everyone touches my heart in a different way. I'm so glad that God gave me a job so that I can have a part. Here was a woman who just had learned to trust God, and it had become a joy in her life to do what she could do. Giving is not a debt we owe, it's a seed we sow. It's a way to say thank you to God for all that He has done. This woman presented her oil. This woman obeyed the Word of God, and in so doing, she delivered her sons. She saved her sons from slavery by obeying God. How many moms and dads tonight have the opportunity to preserve some difficulty in your child's life, to see them even hear the gospel, or maybe children that we've never met that will be saved in that building because we do what God tells us to do. Notice in verse 6, the Bible says, And it came to pass when the vessels were full, that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. And she came and told the man of God. And he said, Go, sell the oil, and pay thy debt, and live thou and thy children of the rest. Oh, listen, our faith in action, our faith in action next Sunday will provide for a generation to come. 
Our faith in action will deliver children, children that need deliverance, children that are being sold into slavery by rock and roll music and rap music and by wickedness and by legalized marijuana and by gay marriage and by MTV and by HBO and in this world that's grabbing children and dragging them to the depths of sin there needs to be a church that reaches out in bus ministry and Christian education and reaches out in love and reaches out to deliver them from the wickedness of this world and all it took was the faith of one little prophet wife, one little widow just doing her part and God said I'm going to fill those barrels up with oil and your children are going to be delivered and I'm excited to simply say tonight that as long as God gives us breath and as long as Jesus tarries in his coming we ought not to look at people that are in drug filled homes and people that are in broken busted up homes and bad situations as a trouble to our society but we ought to see them as people that Jesus loved and Jesus died for and people that Jesus wants to deliver and people that will buy their first ticket and wear their first dress and learn what Jesus' love is all about because of a church that cared for their soul. But somebody had to believe God and somebody had to give what they had. Oh, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus comes that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. And she gave what she could, and God so blessed her life. When we have needs in our life, we can follow the pattern of the widow. We can come to the Lord, and He may say to you, what can I do for you? And He may say to you, what is in your house? What is in your hand? Be careful not to say nothing. You be honest with God. Give Him the opportunity to bless your life. And always remember that we have a God who delivers. Oh, one day He will deliver us from this present world. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of that great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Listen, all we want to do as a church is be like Jesus Christ, who's a redeeming Savior and a loving Savior and a delivering Savior. And He gave all that He had so that we could be with Him and have all that He is. And tonight, as we consider what we'll do next week, it's perhaps one of the most Christ-like weeks in the church where we provide a way for others to hear and to know. Mature Christian givers are motivated by the cross of Jesus Christ. We walk out of here tonight saying, thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. What shall I render unto thee? I will pay my vows in the temple. For all that thou hast done for me. The woman had a dilemma. The prophet had some directions. But God gave the deliverance. And God, my friends, is still in the deliverance business. May we be in the faith business, trusting him every step of the way.